Hello everyone and welcome back to day nine of Bitwise where we build the complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Um, last stream, we, we had both a main stream and an extra stream and we made a ton of progress on, uh, on type checking. And um, since I, I don't want to assume that people viewing the main stream uh, followed the extra stream since it's a bunch of extra time obviously, uh, I wanna uh, review the code we did on the extra stream and what we accomplished and also the stuff I did the same day after, uh, after taking down that stream, uh, which ended up being basically most of all the different cases for expression type checking and inference. Um, so let's just look at some diffs just to remind ourselves of what that was. Um, I think on the main stream we finished after doing, um, I think the two the two big cases we handled on the mainstream last time was uh, function calls, check, uh, type checking function calls, and uh, compound literals. And so there there was actually two substantial changes to compound literals. One of them small but important. The other one more substantial. Um, so let's go over those first, maybe. So uh, one thing that changed, is, which is which, which is the small change that was important. But, but simple, is that um, when we recursively resolve the components of the compound literal, we now pass in the expected type from the field. So if you're, um, let's see if I have some examples here. If you have something like this, I suppose. Um, so if you have something like this, so you have a struct uh, type that's a vector and uh, ignore this add stuff. Uh, but yeah, look at this. So here we have, uh, you know, a, a two-dimensional array of, you know, of, of, of like a two-by-two two array of vectors. And so there's like three levels of nesting. And you can see we don't need, uh, we don't need a, an explicit type specifier either for the top level, which is what we did last time, but neither for the components. So it knows the first component is, is an array of two vectors, and it knows it, when initializing that array of two vectors that each of the components is a vector. So this inner, innermost thing is a vector. This outer thing here is a, a array of two vectors, and this outer thing here is an array of, uh, uh, you know, a, a two wide array of, of an array of two wide vector, something like that. Anyway, two by two array of vectors. So that was a simple change where we um, were really the only, um, the only change was changing from resolve expert to resolve expected expert, where we pass down the type. We were already getting the type for type checking, but now we're just passing it down as the expected type. So that was the first change. Um, the second change was more substantial, which is that we now support named and indexed initializers. Um, so this sort of thing here. Um, and this is, I mean, this is something that C99 has, although we have a slightly nicer notation, I guess. Um, particularly useful for unions. So someone on the forums was saying that it's kind of silly that we don't have this given that we have unions because, and I was planning on always doing it, I just hadn't gotten around to it, because these kind of sequential initializers are, you know, they're kind of a, they don't really, they're legal, but they don't make a whole lot of sense for unions since the whole point is you're only supposed to initialize one of the fields, right? So being forced to initialize, for example, if I wanted to initialize the P field, I would have to initialize uh, the I field as well. Uh, if I wanted to use a compound literal before, but now we have named initializers, so you can say i equals 42, or you can see p or p equals whatever, um, just like c99. The only difference from c99 is c99 requires you to have a prefix dot in this position because uh, assignment is an expression in c, whereas for us it's a statement, so we can have this notation unambiguously. Um, and then similarly for index initializers you can have these uh, prefix square brackets and then a constant integral uh, expression in the brackets equals to whatever and that does what you think it does and so that's all implemented that, re that actually required changes to uh, the parser as well so if you go to uh, parse expert compound um, it used to just parse a an expression and now there's a special compound field struct that it parses and um, it, it, there's three different kinds of fields. There, there's default fields where you don't have a specific field or index. And then there's named and index ones. Um, and so as before, we still have an initializer expression which specifies the actual value of that field or index. Um, but then optionally, we also have a name or an index expression. Um, 
and those are parsed by this uh, parse expert compound field function, which um, uses a parsing trick that we already use for the colon assign uh, operator. Um, so while this is the easy case, if something starts with a left bracket, then we just parse the index expression and then parse the, the initializer expression. Otherwise, um, we do this kind of speculative parse in a sense. So we parse this expr, and depending on whether this is followed by the assigned token or not, it either specifies just a default initializer or a named initializer. And this is the same slightly non-L1 trick, not really. If you have an AST, this is uh, L1 in a sense, and you could refactor the grammar to make it L1 in any case. It would just be uh, a little bit violent. It would require some some uh, some factoring of the grammar that kind of destroys its natural structure. But you can see what it does. We, we, we parse a, a general expression, and then if it's followed by an assignment operator, we validate that this expression that we parsed was actually a name rather than some general uh, expression, and then we construct um, this compound field struct by just extracting the name of the expression. Um, and we use this, we use the same parsing trick. If you look at um, colon assign, we do the exact same thing. So we, this is basically kind of guarded LL1. It's LL1, but then you, in order to make sure it conforms to the, to our actual grammar, we have to validate that this left-hand side expression is actually a name rather than some random expression. Um, so you can see this is very easy to do in this style of parser, but this actually assumes that we have an AST or some way to detect, you know, the thing after it's been parsed, what it, what it is, we can get back the name. This would actually not be, incidentally, this would not be easy to do. This is a side comment, but this would not be easy to do if you had a true one pass uh, compiler, because when you, in a Viet style one pass compiler, when you do the equivalent of a parse expression, you're actually generating code for that expression as well as an immediate side effect to a code buffer. And so by the time you return, uh, you could still, I mean, if you return some auxiliary data that was like, is this a name or not, you would actually be able to do this, but it would be a little bit wonkier because you would sort of already have generated code for this left-hand side. And I mean, so it would it would still be able to, to, you could still use it in that style of compiler, but it would be a little bit wonky, I would say. Anyway, um, so that was a pretty big change. And then in terms of these semantics to go along with those syntax changes, um, that was not too bad. Um, the main difference is that um, what we have is now a running index. Um, so if you do something like this, um, what's the example? Suppose you have var a int two fifty six. If I do something like this, you know, I think we all know what that means. That means uh, you know, index zero should get the value one, index one should get the value two, and so on. But then if there's suddenly uh, I don't know, if there's suddenly something like this, um, then the next index is not just four, it's, uh, or whatever, it's the, the next index is not just a sequential one from the last one, it's explicitly specified. And then after this field, you, you, the index is now, you know, index 43. So if you do this, index 43 would get that value. Uh, and the same is true for named fields as well. So the actual code logic for this is pretty straightforward. You have this index, which gets incremented at the end of this loop. Um, and normally, if you don't specify you know, a, a named or a indexed initializer, that's just what happens. But if there is a named or indexed uh, initializer, then the index actually gets computed based on the name or index. And so for structs, we don't allow indexed initializers, only named initializers. This is just a dumb linear lookup in the type struct. Um, and that's pretty much it. You know, it, it checks that. Um, that you're not overstepping the fields in the struct. And there's more or less the same thing here for arrays, except arrays don't accept named initializers, only index initializers. And it checks that you don't have ne negative uh, constant expressions for the index. And it checks that it's within bounds as well. And that's about it. So this is a, a fairly simple change to the code we already wrote, um, but it's pretty powerful. And I uh, was pretty happy with how quickly we could uh, kind of jam that in. Um, OK. So that was one of the big changes. Let me just look at some other stuff we did. Um, this was the stuff we wrote on the extra stream just to see if there's anything very interesting here. Uh, one thing we did was we um, we added a fairly complete suite of of integer binary operators, uh, including constant folding. So it's I mean it's still very we we only have one kind of integer basically. Um, so it's very limited in that sense. But we we did that suite. Uh, same for unary, um, 
and I mean, it's just very simple minded right now. It just has these uh, eval functions for doing the constant expression evaluation. And, uh, you know, this is was, was kind of, you know, when I assigned that, what is it, homework one, that was kind of the point is that you end up doing basically the same thing we did in the homework uh, for the constant expression evaluator. So even though it's a compiled language, you do need to have this kind of interpreter style evaluation in the compiler itself for constant expressions, not as an optimization, but just in order to even do type checking correctly uh, in, in C and C-like languages. So that's it's bas it should be very familiar if you did that homework, basically the same idea. Um, what else? I guess I added a void type and a char type, and I don't think we validate correct uses of those. Like I think you can declare, you can currently declare variables of type void, which is not legal, shouldn't shouldn't be legal, but some of that stuff is is still allowed, hasn't been tamped down on. Um, other than that, some stuff with pointer decay, which is not consistently applied, so don't expect that to be consistent yet. I'm still mulling over the best way to handle pointer decay, so we don't have to call that function everywhere. Um, let's see here. Right, that's stuff we already covered. Yeah, so not not a whole lot of, of interest there. Um, some, some small fixes. Uh, I added type alignment which, I mean, it wasn't a lot of code and maybe it has issues, but it's, at least it's it's supposed to be in. Um, so, oh right, so first off, uh, in addition to having a size field, types now have an alignment field called align. And this is filled in right now for the built-in types. And of course, this should eventually be driven by the back end, uh, what the back end wants for these uh, type sizes and alignments, but I just filled in uh, what what is basically the standard uh, sort of 64-bit um, x86 uh, x64 type of values for now and then um you know uh pointers of course regardless of their base type always have the same size and alignment uh arrays are uh have the same alignment as their element type and functions have the same have, have you know same size as alignment as a any other pointer uh, and then for structs the way it works is uh, the alignment of a struct is the maximum alignment of any of its fields and the size. Now, it used to be just that this was a dumb accumulator where it would just add up all the sizes, but now it actually does, um, it rounds up to the alignment of the field. So each, as you go through the fields and sort of include them, you always round up to its, uh, to its required alignment uh, first. So eventually we'll want, and this is probably... It's not required for the C code generator, but uh, it, it would be a nice thing to do, I guess, soon, is we actually need to store the byte offsets of the fields within the type. Um, right now, we're kind of doing the work to compute it in order to compute these sizes. But this calculation here is basically the offset calculation for the, the field it. Uh, and so we should be storing that off as well so that you can consult the uh, field offsets. Certainly, this is something a real code generator would need. Um, but if you want to implement a... Uh, you know, if you wanted to implement, as we will eventually at least, offset of, this is something you would want to support as well uh, to drive that. So anyway, so that, that's it for that. Uh, unions, of course, um, uh, the size is not the sum, but it's the max of everything, and it gets the alignment of the worst case alignment of any of its fields. So I think, I, I, I mean, I haven't really tried to break this yet, but um, that's, that should be the basic alignment logic. This doesn't, of course, support manual packing, like type packing and stuff like that. This is just standard natural alignment. Um, all right, what what was the other stuff? Um, right, this is the one I talked about. I talked about this. All right, so I think that's pretty much catching us up on where I left off. I didn't really have time to code yesterday dealing with uh, with US taxes. So uh, I think we'll just continue where we left off. I should mention, I was hoping to get to code generation today, but because I couldn't really code yesterday, that, that wasn't possible. So I thought um, today we'll finish up uh, type checking and inference for, um, for statements, so which is basically everything inside a function. And um, that will require us to do things like you know, cleaning up the way we do simple tables so we can handle nested scopes, and it will require us to just go through the different statement cases and support those properly. Uh, the 
statements themselves, I think I alluded to last time, uh, will mostly be straightforward because we've laid all the groundwork with the expression stuff. Um, so probably the main thing will just be um, doing the nested scopes properly because right now we just have a flat top level scope and we need a way to sort of push and pop nested scopes. Um, all right, so uh, one thing that was bugging me and maybe I'll make that change right now is that, I don't know, um, I kind of feel like this entity term, this is something I inherited from an old compiler of mine where it made more sense. I want to rename that to, I mean, this is a trivial change, but I want to rename that to uh, symbol or something like that, or sim. Um, except not destroying the case in the process. Isn't there a type preserving? Okay. Okay, so that compiles. Um, let's see. Right, so right now we have this, uh, I guess it would be called Sims. Okay, so some of these words like entities still need replacement. Oh, those caps. I thought there was a case, a case insensitive, but case respecting replacement, but maybe this is Visual Studio, so it sucks and it doesn't have that. Uh, but anyway, also happy to do it manually. Um, actually, let's do some cleanup first. This is something I wanted to do. Yeah, let, let's do cleanup first. Or maybe let's not. Let, okay, maybe let's just, maybe let's just dive in. All right, so right now we have this top level Sims and these should probably be called like global sims. So let's just see where that breaks stuff. This is the kind of thing I, I intentionally don't use search and replace for, by the way, because I just like to look at the cases since we'll be touching that stuff in a bit anyway. All right, so um, eventually, and I actually plan to do an optimization pass this weekend off stream so people don't have to look too much at it. But eventually, of course, we'll have a hash table rather than a linear list for the global sim search. Um, but even when we add the hash table for that, my plan is to use uh, a linear search for the nested scopes because the, Keeping the nested scopes linear means that you can use a basic stack approach to uh, to build and, and, and pull down, uh, you know, like nested block scopes and functions and such. And uh, and then you can just kind of search up the stack from, from the top to the bottom uh, and, and handle shadowing correctly. And if it hits the bottom, then it goes and consults the global sims. So um, that's kind of my plan for that. Um, and let's see here. So the way we'll do that is, I guess we will have um, we will have local sims, but this will be this will actually be a static array. So I don't know. Let's just make it like this. We'll bounce check it, but let's make it something. Fairly excessive, but certainly sufficient, I would assume. Um, and then my plan is basically that, let's see. Um, there should be some sort of, you know, maybe something like this which will start pointing to the bottom of the stack um, or the base of the stack.
And then my idea roughly is that Um, let's see, um, until, uh, until this is equal to local sims, then we decrement and we have to do, because we're counting down, this, this came up on the discord the other day, but um, this is how I usually do countdowns because there's always an asymmetry with pointers and indices between countdowns versus countups. So local sim itself is actually not, doesn't really point to a usable symbol. Uh, this is, you know, kind of the end pointer. Uh, so maybe I should call it end, actually. That's a better name. Um, and then basically in order to actually do a check, you know, you do, you basically do it like this. Um, So the you know the reason you do this is that this is kind of like the equivalent if this was an an index this would be something like this um, so you know we, we all know this is how you iterate up um, but when you're iterating down um, well there's two approaches basically here's here's one that's a bug which is a very common bug this is a bug because if you're using an unsigned uh, index um, then you're waiting for this to go negative to signal the end of the loop, but it will never go negative because it's non-signed. So it will just wrap around to whatever max size. Um, so there's, you have two choices here. You can use this um, or something equivalent, like, you know, you and putter if you wanted it to be sort of more or less as wide as, as size T. Um, but you can also do basically the equivalent of what I'm doing here, which is you, you use it more or less perfectly symmetric um, with the, the counting up. So you can see we're just swapping the roles of zero and n, and we're swapping less than to greater than, and so on. But now when you're doing the actual, the, the i is not really pointing to the element, it's pointing one past the element, essentially. So you have to, when you're accessing the element, you have to do uh, this minus one. So there's other idioms that can work, but especially for pointers, I find this uh, most convenient, I guess. And actually, if you want to be like a, st a stickler for standards correctness, uh, you're allowed to pass one. You're allowed to point one one past the end of an array, but not one pat before the start of an array. So this is another way to prevent that. Um, like you're not even allowed to to do this decrement, basically. Um, if if the if it if, if it points to the beginning of an array, that's already illegal. And I'm not saying you should necessarily respect that because that's kind of a a weird C thing. Uh, where it kind of pretends that pointer arithmetic doesn't really work the way it does on most computers. But in any case, if you want to follow, if you want to be a, a legalist, this is, I think, more or less how you have to do it. Anyway, um, so yeah, do it like this. So first, we, we search the, the, the stack from top to bottom. If we find something, we return it. Otherwise, we consult the global symbols. And if even that doesn't work, then we return an all to signal that we didn't get a hit. Um, and so right now the stack is empty. And so actually we should be able to have all our existing stuff just work um, because you know the stack is empty and it should be able to just hit the global symbols. And it looks like it did. Um, so um, now if you want to well, now let's make a function called simpush, which takes a symbol. And, uh, and this is, I, I'm not going to use an assert because this is something that could totally happen uh, for reals. Uh, if uh, local sims end is equal to local sims plus um, max local sims, then um, you know, too many local symbols, basically. And uh, otherwise, we do the standard idiom here uh, to push this thing on the stack. And uh, so let, that let, lets us push stuff. Now, in order to pop, what we're basically going to do is when you start defining a new scope uh, in one of your functions, 
um, the type checker or the, the code generator, whatever cares about this, is going to remember where the stack was, the stack pointer was on entry, and then it's going to reset it on exit. And so it will remember where it was on entry, uh, and then a, a, you know recursively there'll be a bunch of pushes, and then when it returns out, it will restore the stack pointer to where it was on entry. Um, and we just rather than having a rather than remembering sort of in our data structures at this level where those kind of demarcations are, we can just have the functions store that themselves and reset it. Um, and so maybe we'll say uh, maybe we'll have some helper functions for that just to make it a little less kind of uh, naked. Um, so let's call that. Let's see. Uh, save. I don't know, save locals or um, what's a good name for that? Let's say enter maybe and leave. Um, some locals new. And uh, let's see, sim locals. This is called pointer. It's not. Um, and so this returns the current value. Something like this. Do we not call it that? Oh, local, local sims end. And so the idea is that we will write code like this. Um, like when entering a new scope, we will basically do um, sim enter, sim leave, you know, push a bunch of, of symbols. Um, and so it will look something like this. And you can see we, we remember where to restore the, the, the local sim stack to in a local variable in the function rather than having an array of, of these kind of demarcations globally. So this is just kind of a simple, convenient thing to do. Um, so I think that's reasonable. All right, let's... Um, let us now do functions. Let us do functions. So, um, let's see. So we already have something called resolve func, I guess. Let's see, resolve decal func, which really doesn't descend into the function. It just really creates the the symbol corresponding to the function, uh, you know, including the complete type signature, which is what the other uh, the other declarations really need to know about to to take care of their business. But we need something that also does actual work, kind of like complete type for structs and union definitions does the actual work of filling those in. We need something kind of like that for functions. So I wonder what a good name for that would be. Um, I mean, we could just call it resolve func for now. Um, And um, let's just remind ourselves of what's in that. So there's a bunch of params. I guess actually it would be convenient just to do this because we already have we already have the type the, the types fully resolved up here. Um, And let's say that this has to be resolved. Sorry. Um, and so you have the type from that. 
All right. Um, so I guess the very first thing is we have to, you know, we have to, we have to create a new scope and um, we have to go through, I guess, let's just assert that this is, um, this is the right kind of, th right kind of thing. Um, Let's see, so sim, what does sim new do? We probably need, um, let's create something called like sim param or sim var. Um, so sim var takes a, um, a name and a type. And again, I mean, this is all, all this stuff is all going to, uh, go to the temp allocator once we do an optimization pass. So this is going to be like a var, I guess. Um, and uh, even though, I guess eventually we'll need to distinguish local from global vars for sure. Um, that has different meanings in some cases, but um, let's not worry about that for now. I don't think we need to do that for the first pass uh, that we're doing today. So create a sim var under that name. And uh, I guess we will have a null declaration. Um, and we'll make sure that it's basically resolved, which, you know, it's a local, so um, so maybe let's call it like a local var. Um, and so let's see, we fill that in, and then we have to fill in the type. Um, and we will, for, for now, let's just treat these as vars, which in C is more or less what they are anyway. Um, so let's remind ourselves of what this stuff is. Oh, we don't have, so, okay, we actually can't do it this way for now. We'll probably need to change this eventually. I think eventually we'll need to have uh, function parameter names as part of the type at least for, well, anyway, we, we can't do that this way right now. So let's uh, instead, um, what's the function we were defining? It was all func. Let's instead just parse the AST directly and, and do things that way. Um, so let's forget about this type actually. So decal func num params. Let's see what is what's in this thing. Params, okay. Num params red type and then a block. Gotcha. Um right, so sim push, sim local var um I don't like the word. Let's just call it var. I don't know about the local stuff. Um, sim var, and we have to provide um, a name and then a type. And so pram type, I guess is what it's called, right? Yep. And um, all right, all right, all right. So now we've installed all these under their proper names. And I guess we now have to resolve statement block. Um, we have to resolve the return type. Resolve type spec, decal func, red type. Um, so anytime we're processing statements, we're going to pass down the return type so that if you see a return, you can validate that it has the correct type for that return expression. So we're going to pass that down. 
and um, I mean, there's no reason to put it in the temp variable, really. Something like this. Okay. Um, resolve statement block. So this is really just a list of statements. I think I call it the statement list. Which maybe I should rename back. I don't know why I renamed it. Um, okay, and then we simply do this. So this is going to be the the big kahuna the thing that actually is the main the main player that does all the dispatching let's see here okay we don't actually return stuff okay okay let's just go through this stuff then Let's see here, statement. What's it? Statement assign. Let's just make a copy of this stuff. So we have something to look at. Um, so if there's a declaration, um, let's let's only handle. Uh, let's only actually let's not even handle declarations uh let's only handle these sort of short form what do i call them init statements or init declarations for now um because the other stuff there's some i guess some things that would be nice to defer so yeah let's let's make sure we we assert if if we don't handle some case that's been deferred for now um okay let's do statement return because that's where the ret type thing is for, so it would be nice to get that out of the way. So, um, so you would, let's see, you recursively resolve. Oh, and we want to use expected. Oh, that's another nice reason. Uh, when you're doing a return, you can pass down the the expected type from the return value from the return type. And so, um, I mean, I can't remember what half of these things are called at this point, but um, Again, these are the the shitty award-winning error messages you've come to know and love. I don't know about it, but but about you, but uh, when I'm writing code, thinking of good error messages is such a cognitive shift that I really can't do it. Um, anyway, so right, check those, and then I guess that's really it um, because we're not really producing anything. I think later on we will want to do control flow analysis at some basic level to make sure that all the paths, at least sort of the obvious idioms work for say an infinite loop, uh, or other, or, you know, like if you have an if statement with, with multiple branches, if all the branches return in every case, then you want to say the if as a whole returns in every case. So in some, at some point we'll want to propagate that kind of control flow information back up from resolve statement. But for now, we're not really producing that kind of ancillary data. So uh, let's just do the checking and move on. Um, all right, and so that was returns. Why, what did I forget to close here? statement uh, break for a break there's really nothing to validate so let's just say uh, do nothing um, if there's a block then we do resolve statement block and just look what the fields are I can't remember at this point what all the fields are called 
Um, gosh, why is it not going to the actual definition? There we go. So, I mean, let's see here. Okay, so I guess this is actually called this expression. Um, and for block, it is called just block, very creative. So that was the right name. Um, if, I guess, is slightly fancier. Let's see. Um, let's be really stringent for now and say that only integers can be in the branch uh, branch condition. And so, um, probably some of this should be factored out for some of the type checking, but let's just do that. Um, let's see here, if statement, resolve the condition. there. Um, and uh, let's call it okay. And uh, resolve statement block. Let's have block that type. And then there's an optional, not mandatory, else block. Um,
why is that not working? So statement, if statement, else block, dot statements. Seems fine to me. Why is that not? Oh, I see. Um, what's the next thing? If while, so while is a little bit easier, I suppose. Um, you know what, let's make a function called resolve cond expression. Um, just basically this thing. Uh, if while do while I think this is exactly the same they use the same fields um, for case so what is there to check uh, I guess we have to check that oh so this one's interesting so, so this can introduce this has a interesting scoping discipline so i think you have to do oh and this is true for everything so let me do it a little bit weird so actually resolve statement block should introduce a new scope like that, and then this one is a little bit funky. I'm going to introduce an additional scope, even though the inner block also has a scope. Um, and the reason is when you do resolve statement, of the uh, init, let's see here. Sorry, let me just write this. Um, no, that isn't the scope, so that has to be there. Um, so let me explain the logic here. When you have something like this, um, you know, if you have something like this, this thing introduces a new identifier, so we have to obviously have a new scope for that. But that actually begins before, in some sense, this begins before this scope. And in addition, if I have something like this in here, I I mean, this is my choice, but I kind of don't want this. I like I don't want to be able to do something like this. This to me breaks some. I mean, even though this could be supported, to me this breaks some basic kind of lexical structure about scoping. So I'm actually going to introduce a scope that covers. I mean, it covers the whole body, but it covers also just this part here. 
uh, I think that's the right choice, but um, easy to revisit later. But what that means is we both have this scope here, but then also the resolve statement blog introduces an inner scope. And that inner scope won't be visible to this next statement, for example. Um, so that's the idea. But then if we resolve this statement and it has a statement in it, that will put stuff into this scope. So that will be visible to here, but also to the condition and also to the next statement. So I think that's right. Um, and incidentally, I think you can see how easy it is to work with this enter leave stuff and how naturally the code just, you just call the code in order and it sort of, everything gets into the right scope. So not like some kind of crazy revolutionary thing, but uh, it makes, you know, it makes a difference about how you structure this stuff. So you can easily do these things without a lot of ceremony. It just kind of works. All right. Um, and then I guess switch as a, another big one. Um, so where are we? We've done four. We want to do switch. Um, switch, switch, switch. It's probably going to require some locals here. So switch. Um, so let's call this. I don't even know what to call this. It's called result. I don't know to find better names for some of these things. Um, let's see, switch statement. All right, so we resolve this. And then we have a bunch of cases. And each of those cases I don't know what to call this. Case result switch, let's call it result. Um, and so you have, you have these guys and, uh, you basically, and again, we're not doing our, our type checking is very kind of rigid. We're just doing direct comparisons, but we're just going to verify, um, that these things match. Um, and then I guess we just do resolve statement block, um, switch case block ret type, something like this. What in the world? I keep writing that. Oh, right, red type. All of these things need a return type. Um, and then there was a sign. So let's see, an assignment has um, there's like a left hand side. What's that called? I see left. Let's just call it left then. And then, so this is a you know a nice thing is that 
you can resolve the right hand side in the context of the left hand side's type. So you can do this. Um, but ultimately, you do have to validate that they match. And um, in addition, you have to check only assign to L values. This is something we'll need to, this is something that needs revisiting. In C, being an L value is not actually sufficient um, to be, you know, despite the name L value, which from Algol designates something that can go on the left-hand side. In C, there's the notion of a non-modifiable. So we don't have that right now, but like if you do something like, like this, then X is an L value, but it's a non-modifiable L value. Oops, OBS just went down. So let me just wait for that to reconnect while I have a drink. All right, looks like it reconnected. Gotta love my super stable internet. Um, I assume people can see this now. I'll just repeat where I left off. Uh, what I was saying was I was just making a small note about how in C there's a notion of a non-modifiable L value. So in this uh, stupid example here, I mean, I'll show you what happens, but you can see L value specifies const object. So the C standard calls this a non-modifiable L value. Right now we don't have const qualifiers, so we don't need to worry about this, but um, that will need to change at some point. But anyway, so yeah, I think that's it. So we resolve both of these right-hand side and resolve with an expected type of the left-hand side. So we can, you know, for example, if you have uh, if you have something like this, you can just do this. So the right-hand side is resolved in a context knowing that v is a vector. So allows compound literals, for example, to be written more, more short shortly more shortly, shorter. Um, all right, all right, all right. And then actually, I guess this is not quite sufficient because there's different kind of ops and so let's do something simple for now. Um, let's say that if you're using any of the ops, um, Um, then the left-hand side type so th this is again kind of placeholder but what that means is you can do this kind of thing for anything you know as long as the types of x and y are compatible and compatibility right now for us means exact match but that will change um, but if you do something like this I mean, you know, they have to, this this should be type checkable if uh, X plus Y is type checkable. So we'll want to do something that's more consistent with the way we handle binary operators. But right now, binary operators only work with integers as well. So it's, it's internally consistent, even if it's not uh, how you'd want to do it long term. So um, let's look at that. Okay, and then we have one case left, which is init, which is the one that's going to actually introduce a new symbol for us, a new variable symbol. And um, just in case we need something like that. Actually, I think it's going to be pretty simple because what we're going to do is we are going to, um, let's see, resolve to expert init, resolve expert. It doesn't have any expected type because we're inferring the type from the, the, the result of that. But, um, Let's see, statement init uh, expr, and then we will sim push a sim var called name init. Actually, and let's just do it like this. Make it really simple. 
already. Um, is there something we have to validate that it can or cannot be? I guess not. If this function returns, we're good. Okay. There was a bunch of code without any tests, so let us let us test some stuff. Um, let us test some stuff indeed. All right, so let's just start really simple. Do something like this. Well, first, let's just make sure it compiles with nothing. Um, let's change this complete sim function to let's call this. It's probably not the right way to do it long term, but this is a way that is sort of congruent with what we're currently doing for struct and unions types to, to fill them in. Um, okay, why is that not? Oh, okay, it's just all this junk. So let's see what happens, okay. I think this is actually going to crash. Yep, because I'm not handling the void type, implicit void type thing. Um, that should probably, eh, I mean, it makes me feel weird. Okay, let's do it for now, but I feel like this is, this would clean up some code, but potentially, fail to catch other cases. Um, all right, so solve funk. Okay, so let's just verify. Yep, that's good. And then, um, okay. There's nothing, okay. So let's um, let's do some simple stuff here. Let's say we have, um, well, let's also have a, a global variable. Actually, let me, let me don't, let me not like the whole complete sim. I don't wanna do it this way actually, because I wanna make sure that, um, No, that actually should be fine. Never mind. Let's just leave it like that. Um, all right. Yeah. So let's let's have some some globals and some locals. So let's say there's a global called i, and let's just first check that we can do. Um, I don't know i plus plus. And actually, this is going to crash because I forgot to handle a case. But well, it should catch itself right because it's arguable whether these should have been collapsed to one statement kind but right now um, the increment and decrement operators are considered assignment operators without a right hand side expression which is I mean I guess it's not too hard to handle it here um, yeah, I guess that's fine, actually. All right. Okay, so that didn't crash. Just some sort of progress. Um, so let's just, actually, let's just set a breakpoint there permanently.
So left hand side is an int and it's an L value, which is correct. Okay. Let's do some stuff with uh, its own locals. Like um, if I do something like this, let's just make sure that the existing code still works. Okay, it does. Um, let's do something like this. That also works. But uh, we should verify, for example, if I remove this, I mean, it, sh it shouldn't work. It should say non-existent name or something like that. Yep. All right. Um, okay, so this is some basic <laughs> crap. Um, we can also do, I mean, let's get some vector vectors into the action. You could also do this. Um, oh, let's try something spicy. Let's do, I think this should just work. I think I do the, the L value handling for fields correctly, but if I do this equals, I don't know, Y two times J, something like this. Let's see if that works. That works. Um, let us do, let's just get rid of this then. Um, maybe we'll leave this and create a new thing. Um, so what are the other cases we have to handle? I guess an interesting one would be for, or actually let's also do arguments. So if you have something like this, um, does that work? That seems to work, but if I change this to float, oh, that doesn't work. All right. Um, Let's remove this breakpoint. It's just annoying at this point. Oh, non-existent name. Why or why that? Oh, float is not. I thought I had a binding for that. It was a different error, not the expected one. It's still... It should, it should, yeah, still an error, but this time it's yeah return type mismatch, which is what we actually wanted. All right, let's take um, um, yeah, let's take something here with like some parameter, and then let's say if x um, return two times x, or let's say yeah. If x return minus x, else return minus one. That works. Um, um, let's do a four. So if I do, right, let's say n here, uh, if I do something like this, um, that also seems to work. Um, so this is in scope. Let's check that other stuff is not in scope. Like um, if I introduce a new local variable here, that should not be in scope here. Yep, non-existent name.
Um, okay, uh, let's let's do some switch stuff. Um, let's say we switch on this and we say zero one return forty two case three default return minus one. Okay, so that doesn't work because oh and this is this looks like uh, uninitialized memory which is interesting oh this is a classic i versus j worst symbols ever uh, most visually distingu indistinguishable symbols ever and nevertheless sequential in the alphabet. So thank you. But I will still stick to them because I'm stubborn. Okay, that works. Um, let's see here. Let's do a while. I'm not gonna check every single corner case, KLM. Um, actually, let's just call them F1, F2 so I don't have to do this stupid stuff. Uh, while x, x minus minus, I don't know. Let's say there's a, an accumulator here. We'll do some kind of exponential doubling. And then when we're done, we return i. Let's call this n instead, and this will be like p per product. How are we doing on time? All right, we're doing pretty good on time. We're about an hour in. Let's see if that works. Let's do the same thing with do while, even though it's probably not very meaningful, at least using the same algorithm. Okay, that works. Um, what else do we have to handle? Again, I'm not gonna try to go for like full code coverage. I just wanna make sure we handle the major categories. Um, ifs while do while for switch assign init. So I think that's everything. We should probably handle something with else if we didn't really do that. Um, Okie dokie. <clears throat> okay, let's do something like this. Um, let's take one of these bad boys and see if that type checks. And it does. Okay, that's not the right breakpoint. Okay, excuse me, I have to cough. probably have an emergency mute button for that purpose. Um, yeah. So that pretty much all just worked. Caveat, given the caveats we made along the way about certain things not being in their final form in terms of we need to support non-modifiable L values and more loose typing C style and things like that, but Given those caveats, this mostly seemed to work. And hopefully this proved the point that statements are not really difficult for type checking. Uh, it's basically just expression stuff and then the return type propagation. Uh, the, the main thing that you would probably want to change is like you need to do some sort of simple control flow, conservative con control flow analysis to make sure that um, you were, you know, you 
as, as far as the compiler is concerned, that you're returning values on all control paths. Uh, and of course, even the uh, modern C compiler uh, it can't always do that. Like for example, if I call a function like fatal, even though every, it will never return, uh, the compiler doesn't know that. You can sometimes use pragmas to tell, tell it about it, but um, you at least want to support some basic idioms like if you have an if statement, and like I said, all and both branches always return, then the if statement should be considered as always returning, and hence it doesn't have to be followed by an explicit return for the compiler to be assured that uh, all branch, all paths can return a value. Um, actually, I just realized that um, return, let me see in the parser here, parse statement return, or uh, something with return. Um, Right, so there's an optional return value, and so if we should handle that here. Um, let's see. So if there is a statement, then we do this. Else, um, it means that it's implicitly void. So we want to basically say if this is not equal to void. Um, Let's just check that. Well, let's first check that everything runs as before. Great. And let's have a function. Like, let's have a, a, one of these void functions. And uh, first, we should just be able to say return like this. And that works. But then if I try to return a value, it should complain. Oh, return type mismatch. I guess that's fine as well. So, but but the, I guess the other case that I just implemented was really... Um, more like this, if, if you have something that expects an int and you don't return anything. So yeah, no, it's the other way around. So my, the, I'm trying to return. So um, empty return expression for non void, for, for function with non void return type. Again, award winning error messages, as you've come to expect from this high quality establishment. All right. Um, is that about it? I think that's about it. Um, and so we're a little bit earlier than usual, which I don't think is a bad thing. Um, but maybe people have caught some bugs that I didn't. I mean, the code coverage here is, is very incomplete, but um, maybe we'll do Q&A and then I'll fix any bugs that people have noticed that I didn't notice. And uh, we might call it early today otherwise if there's nothing super exciting, but let's see what people are saying. Uh, duplicate F5, all right, good call. I should also catch that, but right now I am not. Ooh, all oh, right, I didn't. That. Yeah, so uh, any questions, uh, let me know. I'll also scroll back to see if people mentioned something. Someone's asking about function overloading. Nope, definitely not. Function overloading is my least favorite thing in the world. Uh, fun can function contain other functions? Uh, I mean, it's not supported right now because I think you'll recall that. Uh, Right now, st statement decal isn't handled in general. We only handle these statement init cases, which is a you know a, a simple variable and initialization and a declaration in one. But yeah, the plan is I don't know if it'll be in version zero, but the plan is you can declare local functions. They won't have it won't be like closures, right? They won't be able to access the outer scope, um, which means we also need to change how we handle scope a little bit for those things, like. Hmm. Yeah, that might be a little bit annoying with the way we're doing uh, our local symbols. Um, if we want to, we, we might have to hoist them up in some fashion for when we're doing our type checking in order to, for the, to work that in a simple way. But yeah, we'll support that eventually. And it will, at the C level, it will just correspond to a, a local named function, but it will have the same semantics as a top level function, of course, because that's all C has. All right. Um,
Pum, pum, pum. Let's see what people are saying. Uh, Sean's saying this is why you shouldn't use unsigned stuff like size T. I, I kind of agree. I'm, I'm, you know, it's it's weird. There are certain coding hats, sort of default things that I've changed over the years. And one thing I've vacillated on a lot is using signed versus unsigned quantities. And I, I kind of believe nowadays that you should just use int for everything, like signed int for everything, unless it's a sort of storage encoding kind of thing like a, very, a kind of low level packing or like you really need some specific unsigned semantics. But so maybe I should shake that habit, but um, I, I've still stuck with my size T obsession, which is probably a bad habit. Um, but it's definitely like C in particular has a bunch, like C really penalizes mixing signed and unsigned quantities in the same context. So it's better to standardize on one. And given that unsigned stuff cannot accommodate signed th stuff, it's better to just use sign things for everything if you can and stick to that but um yeah then you get annoying stuff like every time you use size of size of returns a size t and so if you use size of in any context you now have to cast that explicitly i mean so it's kind of there, there's always something annoying to deal with and you're just kind of trading off pros and cons but i do kind of believe yeah that default sign types for everything is even in cases where you semantically know that they have to be non-negative uh, simplifies a lot of stuff, but uh, there's there's no real perfect solutions there, unfortunately, especially in C. All right, um, let's see what else I missed. Um, boom, boom, boom. Uh, Sean asks earlier, do compound literals require filling out all fields or are they zero initted? Yeah, so they're zero initted. It's basically C semantics for that. That I mean, right now I am, I mean, I'm just type checking. So in, in some sense, I'm not really mandating what the sort of fill semantics are, but my, my plan is to do zero filling. And in general, you know, I kind of believe that in, in a language like this, making most of your, like, so, so, so here's 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 one thing you could choose to do differently, right? You could choose to have a language which is still very much like this, but it encourages you, for example, in structured declarations to specify non, you know, like default values for fields. And then if you don't fill those uh, fields in an initialize or a compound literal, those get filled in with their default values from the declaration. Um, and that's one approach you can take. The other approach is something that's more compatible with C, which is uh, make make the zero fill case behave correctly as much as possible with all your semantics and your functions and stuff. And I believe that's kind of, that's what Go chose to do as well, even though they could easily have done default values for fields and stuff uh, specified in structure declarations and whatnot. Um, but they chose to use zero fill semantics and certainly C really encourages that as well. Otherwise you need constructor functions everywhere in order to do anything useful, which can get a little bit annoying. Um, so yeah, I'm planning on using the C style zero fill and, and with a strong convention around all your types should have meaningful default behavior with zero fill values. But that's a good question. Um, let's see here. All right, I think that was about it. Uh, yeah, someone was asking earlier about, am I just making a compiler or a language? I mean, it's a very C-like language. Uh, it's mostly based on C, but with some changes to make the compiler easier to write. Um, it's turning out to eventually, I think it's turning into more or less a normal C compiler with a few restrictions at the end. But uh, yeah, so it's both, there's a language design, but there's, it's mainly a compiler. And even the language is designed to make the compiler convenient to write. Um, what was the other thing? The, the reason we need it now is, I mean, par partly I thought it would be fun to start with. Uh, because it's it's going to be actually I think by the but once we're done with it it's probably going to be one of the most substantial pieces of software in the entire stack because a lot of the other things we do will be I mean in aggregate they will be bigger but the individual pieces will be much smaller than a full compiler um, so it, it's kind of fun to start with but also it meant that I could write all my other pieces with ion and so we won't have a lot of C code that won't be portable to the machine. So for example, I can write the RISC-V emulator assembler and disassembler in ion and those will be recompilable for the RISC-V machine. 
And so it's it's a way of just sort of ordering the dependency graph for the things we build so that uh, the minimum amount of code will have to be rewritten. Not that I'm against rewriting code, but it just kind of lets us use the language earlier as well. and makes it feel, it gets more exercise early, I guess, rather than writing, you know, 20,000 lines of C and then having to switch or whatever. Um, anyway, let's see. Uh, am I going to change the syntax of function pointers? Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know what you mean change relative to what. I mean, it, it is what it is right now. Right now, the syntax is, um, I can't remember if I have an example in this file. Anyway, the syntax for function pointers is something like this. Um, so you could do, if this is like a callback, that would that would be, you write it like this. Um, and this is a function pointer. So there's no way to have non-pointer functions right now. It's just uh, the, always the equivalent of C function pointers, never pure non-pointer function types. And if you wanted to have an array of these, you know, you would, you could, you can do this. Uh, you, know, you could have like a bunch of, a bunch of these in an array and that would be the type uh, declaration for that. So yeah, it, it's, it's simplified from C. It's more structured, I guess. It doesn't have any kind of definition follows use or declaration follows use uh, syntax. Um, so, yeah, and, and Sean's asking why I'm writing a language in the first place. Is there no GCC or Clang? I mean, this is just a choice that I don't want to have dependent. Basically, for host development, you know, I'm dependent on the host OS like Windows, Linux, or Mac. But the point, the, the plan is to have absolutely no dependencies for the stuff we build. So literally everything that runs on the target device on the RISC-V machine is going to be something we built. And that's a self-imposed constraint, but it's mostly self-imposed for learning purposes. Um, right, like it's it, it's not because we couldn't just take GCC or Clang, and we'll probably use those for cross validation or whatever for at, at some point. But uh, I wanted to basically keep everything for the target device completely something we created, uh, and that includes cross compilation. Like I don't want to have to use other people's tools to cross compile. It's not just the stuff that runs in the machine; it's also cross compilation, cross assembly, tool chains, and stuff like that. And yeah, like someone said, it forces us to actually use the language, which I think is a problem with most teaching languages is that they're not intended to be used. A lot of the complexity of ION compared to something simpler that you might see in a textbook is also because, you know, I'm a C programmer and I assume that other people here are C programmers. And so I want to be able to do most of the things I'm used to as a C programmer rather than have to use a kind of very restricted language, even if it means more complexity in the compiler. But as a benefit, it also means that people get to see basically everything involved in writing a C compiler without some of the nasty stuff like the preprocessor and uh, some of the weird syntax that C has. And, and someone saying debugger too, yeah, we'll definitely write a debugger, but it'll, it won't be a debugger for host side development. It will be a debugger for, for development on the target. And there will be a bunch of different debuggers. There will be the very low level hardware debugging stuff, and there will be source level debugging. And, you know, since the whole point of Bidwise is to show how to write everything from scratch, that's, you know, we'll be writing things like that from scratch. And I think it'll be simpler than most people realize because for debugging, for example, there's some very low-level stuff that's not super difficult. Um, most of the complexity of writing a good source-level debugger is really about debug info. But because we control the entire stack, including the compiler, we can kind of streamline all the pieces to make that stuff easy. And uh, yeah, so if, if that sounds excessive, like the debugger is not something I'm worried about at all. Um, but yeah, the point is we're going to write all of those things for sure. That's the fun point, hopefully. I mean, I hope, ho hopefully that's what people are expecting is we're going to be writing everything. And a lot of it will be intentionally, I mean, it won't be fully featured if it's too hard to support, but um, like a, a step debugger with source level stepping and uh, type info for, you know, variables and stuff is, is maybe easier than people realize, especially if you don't have to deal with, you know, PDB or some existing legacy formats that are overly complicated. All right. It looks like people didn't notice any major bugs in the code, and it seems to mostly work. So, um, yeah. All righty. Oh, is that John Blow?
Um, someone's asking if I'll be writing an interpreter for Ion and C. I don't plan to do that. I assume you mean like a bytecode VM or something. Um, right now, my plan for the backends is I'll have the C backend, which we're starting on. Well, I'll be starting this weekend or the rest of the day. Um, and then we'll have the RISC-V backend, and that will be a direct native code backend. And it will be pretty straightforward. It's not really an optimizing backend. It won't be stupid. Like it will generate decent code by default, but it will have very simplified register allocation and stuff like that. Um, but that will not be very hard. Based, I, I mean, I say that, but um, I wrote, if you look at my old streams, I did a basic x64 native code compiler um, and in basically two days of streaming. And that was always a dead end project, but that was me starting basically having forgotten anything I almost knew once upon a time about x64 and just opening the Intel manual and just typing code. And even that is not very hard. That was a Viet style compiler in terms of the way I did code generation. And I plan to do the same thing for RISC-V and RISC-V is even easier because you don't have to deal with the dressing modes and all that stuff. And the instruction coding is much more uh, straightforward and regular. So even the RISC-V backend is going to be pretty straightforward. And I don't really see a point in doing an interpreter. I think John does, and I think John's main reason for having a bytecode interpreter for Jai is because he wants to do metaprogramming, and so you know you don't want to. It's easier to to use a bytecode interpreter for that than the native code backend, I guess. Um, but for us, we don't really need that, so I don't plan on doing an interpreter per se. Um, someone's saying code gen. How will you be confident that your Ion compilation is correct? Um, well, I mean, that's like you, you test programs, you, you test, you, you have test programs and you test that they have correct behavior and you try to get good coverage and you can also have disassemblers so you can va validate the code by eye. And given that we don't have crazy optimizations, um, it will be pretty easy to eyeball the code and see if it's doing the right thing. Like it won't be crazy. It won't have crazy code motion or you know, uh, insane inlining and all this other uh, stuff that you see in hardcore compiler backends. And so, it, you know, it, it, there's less kind of intractable combinatorics for testing, but, but it'll be a mix of just sort of black box testing of, of small programs that exercise behavior and you just test that they return the right result. And then you can, if, if there's issues, you can look at things with a disassembler and, and see if it's, uh, if it's broken and do it that way. And there's all kinds of techniques for taking also big programs that are displaying misbehavior and cutting them down using delta debugging techniques, um, like literally chopping it up in various ways until you have a smaller test case that exhibits the same problem. And so even if you have a real world program that exhibits code gen bugs, there are kind of standard techniques nowadays for trying to create smaller test cases automatically so that you can have a human actually look at the output. Um, but anyway, so. It, We'll have an easier task for validating the the backend, given that it's not a crazy optimizing backend. Um, let's see here. Someone's asking about formal verification. I'm not really sure in what context you have in mind. I won't be doing formal verification for the compiler. For some of the HDL code. I plan to leverage, uh, if you guys know about Clifford Wolf's work on, uh, on using Yosis uh, to, um, like he basically has a, an interface to uh, like a bounded model checker and, and some other stuff uh, using, I guess, system Verilog assertions, uh, or maybe there's probably other ways of, do, of, of injecting that information, but basically where you can, you can add assertions to your Verilog code and uh, run it through a bounded model checker. Um, and it does temporal induction and stuff like that. So maybe we'll use some of that stuff when we get to the HDL uh, uh, programming, but uh, I don't plan to use formal verification for any of our software. I don't really know of any tools for formal verification of software code, which, uh, I mean, maybe there's some stuff I don't know about, but aside from the basic stuff like playing static analysis and you know all these other things that, that people use, I don't know of anything that's, uh, that, that's super useful and easy to use for us, but, uh, for uh, for Verilog, uh, you know the sort of bounded model checking and temporal induction stuff in Yosis, that's pretty easy. It's mostly about adding invariants and assertions and stuff like that, and then using the tools and trying to prove properties hold. Um, so maybe we'll use some of that, but that's not, you know, we'll we'll see if we get to that if it makes sense. 
All right. Um, I don't plan to do an extra stream today because I have to do some design thinking off stream uh, for the thing I want to work on next, and it won't be very interesting to look at. So uh, anyway, I'll uh, I'll stop recording, and uh, I mean we reached a pretty good stopping point. I think that basically covers pretty much. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that's been punted on, but it covers basically everything: you know, exp uh, statements and expressions, not just expressions. And so I think this is a good stopping point. So uh, I'll see you guys on Monday, I guess, or Sunday for US viewers. And uh, hopefully with some, some good code gen stuff to show off. All right.